Welcome to the Hopkins Center. Before we get started, please take a moment to locate the nearest fire exit and turn your cell phones and electronic devices all the way off so they emit neither light nor sound. Photography and the use of recording devices is also prohibited. Finally, please remember that masks are required until you leave the building. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. I'm Ann Hargraves. You probably know that, and I feel silly saying it every week, uh, but I am, just in case there's anybody new. Uh, Roland Kuchel and I are co chairs of the summer lecture series. There are a lot of us here in Spalding Auditorium, and about uh, uh, 250 people are remote. We, recommend, we welcome members of our sister programs who are joining us remotely. Granite State Ali in Concord, New Hampshire, UMass in Boston, University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Just to remind you of the Q&A card procedure, those in Spalding were given an index card on entering the auditorium. Please write your questions on this card and submit them to me and the moderator at the break. There is also a wooden box on stage for you to drop your questions into. This week it's actually even there. For those of you joining remotely, there is a chat window. If you'd like to give your name and where you're from, uh, submit your questions there. Will, our student intern, will write these questions down on an index card and give them to our moderator. Thanks to the underwriters who underwrite the whole series. Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, Caldwell Law, Kendall at Hanover, The Village at White River Junction, Wells Fargo Advisors, and our sponsor for this week, Commonwealth Financial. <laughs> Last year, several of our speakers deplored the lack of civics education in our schools. Our first week speaker echoed that concern. A local organization, the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, created this comic book, which has sold nearly 10,000 copies in educator bundles to schools across the country. Copies of it are available uh, at our registration desk for $5. I recommend it to you. New this year, Steve Shema has organized debrief sessions after each lecture. There will be an in-person debrief discussion at the conclusion of this morning's lecture and Q&A, and it, that will begin at 11.45. For those who have registered or, or who are interested in attending, please find OSHER staff member Diane Doe outside the auditorium at door one at the conclusion of this morning's program. Diane will lead participants to the classroom. For debrief sessions in person and on Zoom, happening after each lecture over the next three weeks, please look for an email announcement inviting you to register. There is no cost to these half-hour discussion programs. I would now like to introduce to you Hillary Llewellyn Thomas, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Anne. Can you hear me all right? Or is there feedback? Um, good morning, everyone. And I, I'm, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Michelle Amazine, who is the director of the Communication Research Center and an associate professor in the Department of Mass Communication, Advertising, and Public Relations at Boston University. Dr. Amazine earned her PhD degree in mass media and communication at Temple University in Philadelphia. And her career in the communication industry began by selling, quote, airtime and managing the student's sales staff at a radio station in Champaign, Illinois. Then she worked in the research department of a large retail corporation and later worked with a leading global research agency that studies the effectiveness of different advertising and marketing campaigns. But then, apparently, a post-midnight encounter 
with what is called a brand equity perceptual map of toilet bowl cleaners led Michelle Amzine to reassess her professional aspirations, <laughs> which caused her to return to academia. Now Dr. Amazine's research program works at the intersection of journalism studies, media effects, and political communication, focusing on the perceptual, I'm sorry, the persuasive effects of misinformation in our media, that is, content intended to mislead, and the effectiveness of efforts to correct such misinformation. An overall aim is to identify practical applications for journalists, educators, policymakers, and consumers who strive to recognize and resist misinformation in the media. For example, Dr. Amazine is among the team of 22 prominent scholars from around the globe with expertise in misinformation who contributed to the debunking handbook of 2020, which is a consensus document summarizing the science of debunking for engaged citizens, policymakers, journalists, and other practitioners. Her work has been funded by the American Press Institute and the New America Foundation, and has been reported in a range of academic publications. Today, Dr. Amazine will present a warning that American media may be detrimental to democracy. She will argue that, as the American public is confronted by a daily flood of disinformation, some people may be surprised to learn that mainstream media are contributors to this problem. Not only do digital newsrooms disguise paid content to look like news articles, but also Dr. Amazine's research suggests that this modern form of advertising <coughs> influences the real journalism that appears next to it. <coughs> Dr. Amazine's talk will inform us about the origins and evolution of this media practice, how it affects audiences and the industry, and what the implications are for an accurately informed democracy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Amazine to OSHA's 2022 Summer Lecture Series. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Hillary and Anne and the uh, underwriters of this program. I'm thrilled and honored to be here. So I'm going to start my talk by giving you just a little bit more information about my background and how I got where I'm at. And then I'm gonna put my talk into context of what's happening today in uh, society with the media. And then I'll more specifically talk about how mainstream news media may actually be disseminating disinformation I'll talk about how this affects audiences as well as the journalism industry and uh, what this means for our democracy. And then I'll wrap up with some potential solutions and uh, concluding remarks. So as Hillary mentioned, when I was a student at the University of Illinois, um, I worked in radio. I worked for WPGU Radio um, and that really had um, a great impact on me. I loved music, but then seeing that this is a business and how important metrics were, who's listening, who's the audience, and using that information to inf uh, share it with potential advertisers who are interested in reaching those audience members. So that was very influential on me, showing me um, the, the power of media. And shortly after that, when I graduated, um, Hillary talked about uh, my background uh, working in the industry. Um, I also moved around a lot throughout the United States. So I was born and raised in the Chicagoland area. And um, in 1999, I moved away and uh, lived in Minnesota, Florida, Atlanta, Georgia. Hello to the listeners from Atlanta, Georgia. And um, Philadelphia, outside in Pennsylvania, and 
uh, since 2016, I've been in Massachusetts, in Boston. So that was influential on me because every time I picked up and moved to the next community, I had to reorient myself to what was happening, especially on the political scene. When elections came around, I had to learn about the different candidates, and I found that very difficult to do. Many of the advertisements, the political ads that I would see, one ad would claim this, another ad would claim this, and who knows if any of that was true. And I found that the news media really wasn't holding any of these political actors to account for what they were saying in their political ads. And this coincided with my um, dissertation when I went back to uh, Temple University to earn my PhD. Um, the image I have here on the screen ties in with this story as well. Can anybody tell what that is, what these are? Chads. Hanging chads, yes. So I lived in Florida in 2000. I lived in Volusia County, which was one of the counties where there were hanging chads in the contested 2000 presidential election between Gore and Bush. So this too had a large impact on me um, in terms of uh, how tenuous our political system can be. So I'm going to start here. This is a graphic um, from polling data that came out just the other week from Gallup. And it shows that uh, this trend line is trending down. It's showing how America's trust in institutions has been declining over the last 40 years or so. And it's now at the lowest point it's ever been since Gallup has started recording this. And I'm going to break out some of the uh, institutions that are monitored by Gallup. Two of them, in particular, have to do with the news media. So newspapers between 2021 and 2022 saw a five percentage point decline in trust from US residents. Similarly, so did television news. Now, actually, every single institution that was measured declined in trust, with the one exception of organized labor, which stayed steady. And if we look just at newspapers and television news on this same trend chart, since 1972, newspapers have been on the decline, as has television news. Both of them are at their lowest point ever. And this is not just Gallup. Data. This is consistent across many different polling organizations. Uh, Pew Research, the Reuters Institute, uh, the Edelman Global Trust Barometer, and the Edelman Barometer is global. It's from around the world. So this is a common ha uh, circumstance that's happening across the world. People are losing trust in institutions. Now, there is one little bit of good news. Local news is doing better than some of the other news institutions. So this um, set of bars here, uh, this is among all Americans, these two red bars represent local news, trust in local news versus national news. So local news is significant. People trust local news significantly more than national news. And then it breaks out for Democrats, independents, and Republicans. But overall, the, the point here is um, people trust local news much more so than national news. And I remember this as a kid growing up in Chicago. Local news was always on at uh, my parents' house. Um, uh, in the evening, so my parents liked uh, Walter Jacobson and Bill Curtis, shown here on the left. This is them today. And uh, Bill Curtis is the same Bill Curtis some of you may hear on NPR. He hosts the Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me game show. I'm not sure what uh, Walter Jacobson is up to these days. But then the other person that had uh, 
was influential to me uh, in the new scene was Carol Marin. She was one of the few women journalists. And uh, today, she's at DePaul University. She runs their Center for Journalism, Integrity, and Excellence. So news was important to my family growing up. It wasn't just television news. Um, it was newspapers as well. My family, my parents subscribed to two daily newspapers, the Chicago Tribune and the Daily Herald. But what's been happening lately? There's fewer and fewer of those local news outlets that are available to us. Why is that? So this is an instrumental, an illustrative image. This shows newspaper advertising revenue um, since 1950. And we can see the tr it trends up, reaches its apex right around the year 2000, and then goes off a cliff. What happened? Yeah. So right around 2000 is when the internet starts to become a thing and uh, news outlets moved some of their content online. Many of them didn't charge for it. And um, the other thing is social media, right? So the emergence of social media. So the Apex uh, advertising news revenue, which funds the news that we read and listen to, it was at $67 billion. Um, Facebook's revenue in 2020 was just under $86 billion. So in other words, off this chart. Google, their 2020 revenue was just under $180 billion, twice as much as Facebook. And newspaper revenues continue to decline. So this is not good for the newspaper industry because they're losing money. Um, to further illustrate the digital ascendance, so this is from uh, 2020, this is from Pew, the Pew Research Center, showing that in 2020, the largest proportion of the uh, Americans that they uh, surveyed got their news, often or sometimes, digitally, either from their device, a smartphone, or from, them, from their computers. Le significantly much less so from television, radio, or newspapers. So digital is where people are getting their news. And as a result, this has had a it's decimated the newspaper industry. Throughout the United States, newspapers are closing. Local newspapers are closing. And if they're not closing, they're being purchased by large newspaper chains or um, hedge funds that aren't interested really in the news business. They're interested in profits. There's some exceptions. So some of the legacy news organizations, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, they're all doing well. They are gaining digital subscribers. But I have another uh, graphic here. So this shows what are called news deserts throughout the United States. So the red Highlights show counties that have zero local newspapers in the county. The yellow represents counties that only have one newspaper. So where I grew up, I guess, is, is, is fortunate because there are still competing newspapers. So this, this is uh, from research from um, uh, University of uh, North Carolina, their School of uh, Media and Journalism Center for Innovation and Sustainability. So, so what's happening as a result of the disappearance of these local news outlets 
is this. So there's these seemingly new local journalism sites that are emerging. Um, this is something I've, I've shared with my students and we've done an exercise here um, asking my students to try and figure out what these sites are, who's funding them. So the Illinois Valley Times is one example and uh, the Gander is from Michigan. So seemingly local digital news sites. So uh, the Gander is published by Courier Newsroom, which is owned by a nonprofit group called Acronym. And the Illinois Valley Times uh, is published by Metric Media Foundation. And Metric Media Foundation actually owns like 700 of these types of sites throughout the United States. Now they look like local news sites, but many of them are quite problematic because they are funded by uh, political parties, PACs, um, interest groups. Some of them take money for publishing a story. So you can pay to have your story published on their site. That's not journalism. And um, there's been some scholars who have studied this and they have labeled this pink slime journalism. So it's akin to the meat byproduct that's used as a food additive. This is a journalism byproduct used as a news additive. So their research has shown that although they claim to be local news, many of the, often there's no bylines on these news stories, which is a red flag. But the people who write these stories sometimes aren't even in the United States. And these stories are shared between the 700 plus news sites. Some of the words are changed. So it's not really local news. So this is the, one of the problems that's emerging from this, our loss of true local news sites. Another uh, issue that has arisen are sites like this. So this appears to be um, a health and wellness tip site. <laughs> I'm hearing some giggles, but actually, it's just a giant ad. If you click on any of the links here, they're trying to sell you this wrinkle cream, the space cream. So these seemingly, these seeming news sites are emerging, um, trying to gain your trust. We're gonna give you some health tips. Um, this is a site called truthandadvertising.org. This is a great consumer advocacy site. They've um, shed light on a lot of these fake advertising sites. Um, so the fake news sites that are advertisements. So um, truthandadvertising.org, they're talking about news sites endorsing diet products, face creams, other medical products, maybe fake. So this is in my toolkit to check out uh, truthandadvertising.org site to see what they're saying about um, seeming news sites. But what I really want to focus on today are mainstream news sites that you have all heard of and how they are contributing to disinformation in our media system. So this is a contributor to Forbes magazine, Tony Bradley, he wrote about this a few years ago, how Main Street sites are contributing to the fake news problem. So disinformation is the intentional dissemination of misleading information. And this is happening at sites such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe. What's happening is that these news organizations have created 
internal content studios that create content for companies that hire them. They disguise it to look like news articles, but they're not news articles. They're paid advertisements. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. So here's one example. So there's the New York Times masthead. And this is a seeming news piece about uh, dancers. Human interest story, soft news. You can scroll down, and there's a story. If you look closely, there is a disclosure. It says, paid post, Cole Haan. So Cole Haan is an American luxury brand of men's and women's footwear, footwear and accessories. So they actually paid for this content. So soft news-ish, human interest, is that really such a problem? Maybe, maybe not. Here's another example, a seeming article about global energy consumption. Although it seems to be an article in the New York Times, it too has a disclosure showing this is a paid post by Chevron. So how objective do we think this is, Chevron talking about global em energy consumption? Of course, the content is going to be slanted to make Chevron look good. So these are two examples of what is called native advertising. It's a type of covert marketing practice where an ad mimics or appears native to the platform on which it appears. So this is content that is deliberately misleading or inaccurate, and it's a form of disinformation. And increasingly, news organizations are creating this content internally. They're not hiring outside advertising agencies to do this. It is the New York Times and their T-Brand studio that is creating this content. The Washington Post has their own internal content studio, the Wall Street Journal. Many leading news organizations participate in this practice. Now, what's challenging is that the way it's disclosed is not standardized. Disclosures can say anything from sponsored to promoted to partner content to branded to courtesy of. What does that mean, courtesy of? Many people don't understand that that signals that the content is sponsored, paid for by a corporation, an interest group, foreign governments even. So the US Federal Trade Commission has a policy that they have their uh, FTC Act that's been in place for decades. Section 5 of their FTC Act says that uh, the FTC prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. And in 2015, the FTC clarified this policy, indicating that clear and conspicuous disclosures of advertising content in news and entertainment contexts are required. But they don't say exactly what clear and conspicuous means. It's left open, which is why we have such a plethora of disclosures that many people don't understand. And my research has shown that Many people don't recognize when they see those disclosures. They either don't understand what it means, or they miss the disclosure altogether. So the vast majority of people are unable to distinguish this type of native advertising 
from real journalism. Typically, less than 25% of people that we've surveyed are able to do this. And this is among a nationally representative sample of Americans. Uh, this was some research that I've done with my collaborator, Bart Wodinski, over at uh, the University of Georgia. Those of you listening from UGA, hello. Um, this practice is by design. The news organizations, their content studios, know that their disclosures are hard to distinguish. And that is what they sell to corporations. We'll create something for you that readers want to engage with. Well, readers want to engage with it because they don't understand that it's not news, that it's not journalism. So this is a book called uh, Black Ops Advertising. Um, this is by Mara Einstein. She's a professor of media studies at Queens College at the City University of New York system. And she wrote about native ads. And she gives example after example after example of evidence where news outlets purposefully made their disclosures harder to see. They changed the color of the font, make it ghosted gray. They put the disclosures in hard to see portions of the page. They make them tiny. So this is by design. Now this is something that I've studied, the prominence of the disclosures and whether people can see them or not or understand what they mean. So I'm gonna show you an example. So this was uh, one of my studies with Bart Wodinski from UGA. Um, this is what we showed to some of our participants. We did a, an online experiment. Um, so this is a native ad from Bank of America. Um, it did not run in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, we just used this as an example. Um, we created uh, different mastheads, the Wall Street Journal, we uh, also made it look like it came from the New York Times or Vox Media. But my point for right now is what the disclosures look like. So over here, you can easily see the disclosure. Partner content, it's, a bit, it's in a big red box. Whereas people who saw this, which is more commonly what happens, it says partner content, but it's much smaller and it's harder to see. And our results, not surprisingly, showed that when we used more explicit disclosures, people were more likely to recognize that, oh, this is, ad, this is an ad, this isn't a news article. So we tested three levels of language explicitness. The low explicitness was partner content, what you just saw, what's partner content? The medium explicitness was sponsored content. And then the high explicitness language was paid advertisement from Bank of America in this case. When the word ad is in there, people understand what that means, advertisement. We also manipulated the prominence of the disclosure as I showed you in that example. And then we also manipulated whether or not a logo was present. There was no logo in the examples that we saw. So not surprisingly, the more explicit, the more prominent the disclosure, the more likely people are to realize, oh, this is an ad. So newsrooms know this. They want to keep their corporate sponsors happy. So they play around with the disclosures, and they don't necessarily make them easy for us to see. So what are the effects of this? We've looked at that too. So this is, uh, again, from my work with uh, Bart Wodinski. We're looking at how people respond to native advertising. Among the people who recognized, oh, this is an ad, 
Their attitudes towards the publisher and their perceived credibility of the publisher was significantly lower than people who did not realize what they were looking at was an ad or people who were shown a display ad. So the practice of native advertising has a negative impact on people's attitudes towards the publisher and their credibility. And it doesn't matter whether the publisher is a legacy publisher or a digital publisher. We've tested that, too. This is a study I did with Ashley Mudiman. And uh, people who recognized that the content they were looking at was an ad had uh, less favorable attitudes towards the publisher than people who did not recognize. Digital publishers are penalized more for this practice than legacy publishers, such as the New York Times. Nonetheless, both received less favorable responses from participants when they recognized what they were looking at was an ad. Now, I'm going to go back to this book that I mentioned before, Black Ops Advertising. And uh, there's some blurbs here from various people. There's one in particular I want to highlight for you. Has anybody heard of David Ogilvy? He, ran the, he was the founder of the advertising agency Ogilvy and Mather, which has brought us uh, advertising campaigns over the decades. He's no longer with us. But at one point in his own book, he wrote, there is no need for advertisements to look like advertisements. If you make them look like editorial pages, you will attract about 50% more readers. You might think that the public would resent this trick, but there is no evidence to suggest that they do. Well, today we have evidence that they do object to this. In my work, we've also asked people how they feel about native advertising after we've explained what it is. Most people, 55%, didn't really have anything to say about it. They had neutral or irrelevant thoughts like, I don't have any responses, I don't know enough, nothing comes to mind. But a sizable amount of our participants, and this is another nationally representative survey of US residents, they had unfavorable responses. They were concerned about the credibility or trustworthiness of the news outlet. Makes me think the article is biased and therefore lacks credibility. It's very misleading and bad for a trustworthy news organization. Others were concerned about this, pro uh, this, process, this practice being deceptive. It's manipulative and dishonest. Still others were concerned about the transparency. Seems a little underhanded to me. I do not want to have to read something that is not purely news unless I choose to do so. And if it's not labeled clearly, sometimes the choice is taken away from you. Others, unprompted, spontaneously linked this to fake news. Dishonest, fake news, fraudulent. Now, there were some people who had favorable thoughts when we asked them what their thoughts were on native advertising. This kind of advertising can have good information. OK. This was only 8% of our participants who had favorable thoughts. But even then, some of the thoughts were conditional. As long as it was marked as advertising, then it is fine. So another thing that I have looked at is whether the context of the native advertising matters. And I have a, a short little explainer video that I'm going to share with you right now uh, that explains how we did this and what we found.
All right. So another thing besides the context that I've studied is how people are accessing the news. And as I mentioned earlier, more and more, people are accessing news digitally. So another study I did looked at whether accessing digital news on a mobile phone versus a laptop computer had any effect on people's ability to recognize native advertising. And we also manipulated how motivated people were to engage with the content we were sharing with them. And what we found is that even the most motivated people were less likely to recognize native advertising if they were accessing it on a mobile device. So as society continues to increasingly get their news, not only digitally, but from mobile devices, this portends a problem. Uh, more and more people may potentially be deceived by content that looks like genuine journalism that is actually sponsored content. So I'm going to show you um, some more examples. So beyond the potential deceptiveness of this practice, what's even more concerning are the corporations, the companies that are using native advertising to disguise their commercial messages as news. They're not just benign fashion companies. So this example here is seemingly from the Boston Globe. However, if you look closely, it says this content is provided by Philip Morris International, the tobacco company. So this was a series of native advertisements that Philip Morris paid for in 2021. It ran in the Boston Globe, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Reuters, and in it, they were talking about how misinformation is hindering their work on tobacco harm reduction products, i.e. vaping e-cigarettes. So they are casting the blame on misinformation for muddying our acceptance and our understanding of how helpful these tobacco harm reduction products can be. So here's another example from this campaign. The image is slightly different. So this was in the Washington Post. And if you look closely, there's the disclosure up here. Content from Philip Morris International. So this is the WP Creative Group. That's the name of their in-house content studio. Lost amid misinformation, real people, real science, real progress. And then here's another example that ran in Reuter, Reuters. Uh, it is disclosed, and actually this one has two disclosures, paid for and posted by Philip Morris. And then it also says paid content here. So this is, this is well disclosed. There's multiple disclosures. That's good. The problem is, when these companies engage the content studios of these news organizations, part of the deal, the news publishers are contractually obligated to amplify this content, meaning they need to share it on social media. And when they do this, in this example here, so this was the Reuters example, there's no disclosure. It looks like I'm sharing an article from Reuters. And according to the FTC, these disclosures are supposed to travel with the content. No matter where, no matter where it appears, it needs to be disclosed that this is not news, this is an ad. So, 
Here's another example. This is from the New York Times. If I shared the New York Times Philip Morris article, this is well disclosed. We see the first word is advertisement by Philip Morris International. And again, down here in the Twitter card, this is on Twitter, advertisement by Philip Morris International. This is what's supposed to be done. My research and the research of other scholars shows more than half the time when this content is shared in social media, there's no disclosure. It disappears. That's a problem, especially because research shows that many people don't click through to articles before sharing it online. So you may be passing along commercial content that you thought was real journalism. So another example, um, this is on Facebook. This is from Sheryl Sandberg. She's the chief operating officer of Meta, the owner of Facebook. And she is sharing something from Teen Vogue, how Facebook is helping ensure the integrity of the 2020 election. That sounds great. And she calls it Great Teen Vogue Peace, about five incredible women protecting elections on Facebook. So she's talking about this piece. It's noteworthy she doesn't call it an article because it's not an article. Facebook paid for it. And this came out because on a different platform, Twitter, some user tagged Teen Vogue and said, what is this? And the person running the social media account at Teen Vogue said, literally, I don't know. That's bad if your social media manager is saying that the content in their publication, they don't know what it is. So this, of course, went viral on social media. And if we take a look at the Teen Vogue website where the article actually ran, and Te Teen Vogue, by the way, is not just about fashion for, for young people. They're now getting into current events. Uh, they're talking about politics, so there is some um, newsworthy content in Teen Vogue. Here's what it looked like on their website. It was on their government page. Here's the article. Now, after that tweet that went viral where they said, I don't know what this is, a funny thing happened. Something was added to the article. This, an editor's note. This is sponsored editorial content. Now, of course, Sheryl Sandberg knew what she was doing. They were trying to slip this past us, and they got caught. And Facebook is trying to make themselves look good about what they're doing to protect us from misinformation on their platform, specifically about the 2020 election. And this is increasingly how native advertising is being used. So here's another example. This is real journalism. This ran, this is an, an investigative article that ran in the New York Times uh, back in 2019. Some of you may remember Johnson & Johnson was sued. There was a class action lawsuit because many people who had used their baby powder were developing cancer. And there was evidence that their baby powder was, th their talc was contaminated by asbestos fibers, which is a known carcinogen. So the New York Times wrote about this. This is in uh, February of 2019. And an interesting thing happened that I noticed right simultaneously with this was a native ad from Johnson & Johnson. It is disclosed. There's the disclosure paid, paid for and posted by Johnson's. So J&J &J engaged the New York Times T brand studio, that's their content studio, to create a native ad campaign that debunked myths about ingredients in personal care products. Now, they didn't actually come out and say our baby powder doesn't have asbestos in it, but they're trying to create a positive impression, a favorable impression about their products and what's in them and what's in other products. So, this is a way of whitewashing a crisis. Many times, native advertising is uh, engaged to do this. 
Opioid manufacturers have done this. This was in uh, The Guardian, which is a UK publication. This was a supplement. Opioids could help you manage your pain. Um, there's the disclosure. An independent supplement by Media Planet. So this was uh, in, in 2019 as well. So I started connecting the dots on this. This is um, an article I wrote recently this year in uh, The Conversation about what sort of effects can this practice of native advertising sponsored content have on the news organization and journalism. So the, one of the examples I'm talking about here was from Wells Fargo. And in this case, they're talking about climate change. So what corporations are saying about climate, climate change is consequential, right? Is it's really hot, there's fires, there's hurricanes. It's quite depressing what's happening. So Wells Fargo, which is a financial company, but they were actually writing about how they are investing in a cleaner environmental future. In this native ad here that ran in the Washington Post, again, it is disclosed. What they don't say in their article, because it's a paid ad, what they don't say is that they were also financing the controversial underground oil transport system, the Dakota Access Pipeline, because it's not real journalism. And if you miss these disclosures, you may be confused. And again, if I share this article, this is on LinkedIn, it looks like it's an article from the Washington Post. The disclosure disappeared again. So I took a look at this with my colleague, Chris Vargo, over at the University of Colorado Boulder. And we did a study across five years from 2014 to 2019. We looked at all the native ads that ran in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. And then we selected Fortune 500 companies that were also tended to be mentioned in the news. And we looked to see if there was any change in how news outlets reported on these corporations after the native advertisements ran. And what we found, there were 27 corporations that we followed. What we found is that in over half the cases, there was a significant decline in news reporting on those corporations after they ran a native advertising campaign. This could be problematic if Corporations are able to silence news outlets in telling the public about what's happening. Now, this isn't new. The format in which it's happening is new. And the fact that it's the news outlets themselves that are creating this content that's problematic. But this isn't new. Back in 1949, the Camel News Caravan emerged with a 15-minute uh, news broadcast. Uh, John Swayze was the anchor, and he would smoke camels on set. He would have camel cigarette packs on his desk. Because Camel was sponsoring the news, they were not allowed, during their news program, to sh show any footage of no smoking signs or anybody smoking cigars. So the advertiser was controlling. They had an impact. They had an influence over the content of the news. And of course, in later years, the tobacco industry stifled or punished news organizations who reported on the link between cigarette smoking and cancer. They would pull their advertising. And because the US media system is primarily funded by advertising, this was impactful to many news organizations. 
Now, more recently, researchers have been connecting this to other types of corporations, such as fossil fuel companies. So Naomi Oreskes and various co-authors, in this case, um, Eric Conway, they're talking about, they've demonstrated how climate change denialists have taken the tobacco industry playbook of denying scientific consensus and sowing doubt about what, thing, what the research actually says. And we're only beginning to understand how extensive this effort has been. Oreskes has done some additional research where she and colleagues have looked at ExxonMobil, their internal communications, what their scientists were writing about, and the types of reports that they were publishing internally, saying, yes, our fossil fuels are producing too much carbon. It's hurting the environment. And they compared it with advertorials that ExxonMobil ran in the New York Times between 1977 and 2014. Advertorials are the predecessor of native advertising. Advertorials were print in the New York Times opinion page, and they made their advertorials look like an article. They were labeled nonetheless. And what Oreskes found was that there was a disconnect between what ExxonMobil was saying internally in their documents and what they were saying to the public. This discrepancy, they wrote, given this discrepancy, we conclude that ExxonMobil misled the public. Now, in Massachusetts, the Attorney, Attorney General's office has sued ExxonMobil in 2019. The lawsuit writes, Exxon systematically and intentionally has deceived consumers about the central role of its fossil fuel products and what the role that they play in causing climate change. So this is happening now in Massachusetts. And an exhibit from the lawsuit, a native ad created by the New York Times their, con their T-brand content studio. The lawsuit claims that this advertising is false and misleading and in violation of the state's Consumer Protection Act. It's labeled, paid post, there's the label. Nonetheless, it's an exhibit and a lawsuit indicating it is misleading. So, my concerns are that native advertising deceives audiences. Evidence consistently shows that it does. The, dis the disclosures half the time when the content is shared on social media, the disclosures disappear. And it harms journalistic integrity. We see that there's evidence that it tarnishes the actual journalism. It may contradict what the news outlets journalists are writing. So as news organizations have launched their own in-house content studios, they're now creating commercial material for advertisers. The news publishers are creating this material. And it may directly contradict the reporting of their own journalists. And the news outlets are contractually required to promote that content, which creates a competing agenda for consumer attention. We, only, we have a finite amount of attention. Are we going to read the genuine news, or are we going to read the sponsored content? If we can't tell the difference between what's what, we may be paying attention to the wrong thing. So if news organizations are compromised in these ways by native advertising, how are citizens supposed to be accurately informed to make effective policy decisions on consequential issues such as climate change, which affects all of us. So I'm pleased to share that I and some colleagues at Boston University are now embarking on a focused research program called Data and Misinformation in an Era of Sustainability and Climate Change Crises. And one of the things we're going to be looking at is how many fossil fuel companies 
are using native advertising in news outlets. How extensive is it? What are they saying in their native ads? Is it accurate? Is it labeled? How is it being disseminated through social media? So um, we've just started on this. Hopefully, in the next year or so, we'll have more to say about this. But moving ahead to some potential solutions to get back media credibility. And let me be clear. I'm not saying that the decline in trust in media is due only to this use of native advertising, but it certainly doesn't help. So there's some things we can do with regulations, with the structure of our media system, and then educationally. So in terms of regulation, it's not only federal regulation, it's also self-regulation. The industry needs to better regulate itself. There needs to be greater standardization of disclosures. Everybody is saying something different in their disclosures, which is confusing. To address the issue of the disappearing disclosures when shared on social media, we need to embed digital watermarks. So no matter where the content goes, the disclosure will be there. And the Federal Trade Commission needs to do a better job of enforcing its policies that are already on the books. There's very little enforcement for violations, like I've been showing you. And I think that news organizations also need to be reassessing the risks of engaging in this practice. Is it really worth the financial benefit if you're losing credibility with your audiences? Now, other scholars who have studied how journalists are responding to this have demonstrated that journalists are largely resigned that this is this is what's happening, and there's not much I can do about it. They're resigned. Some are pushing back. One noteworthy pushback was with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in Canada. So this is the public broadcaster in Canada. They recently launched a program called Tandem, and their journalists revolted. They wrote an open letter to Canadians from CBC journalists. You may have heard that CBC management has launched a new marketing division called CBC Tandem. Its purpose is to sell corporations the opportunity to disguise their advertising as our journalism. CBC is using its resources to help advertisers trick Canadians. They call what they produce paid content, and it's insidious and we believe strongly it must stop. This is the CBC's own journalists that are writing this. Unfortunately, despite their complaints, the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission, the CRTC, which is akin to the US's FCC, Federal Communications Commission, they renewed the CBC's license to broadcast, and they said they could keep their controversial branded content division. So other solutions, we need to protect our public media, better fund it permanently to protect it from commercial interests, like what's happening in Canada. We need to pass new tax laws to allow low and no profit designations. ProPublica is one example of a nonprofit news organization. There's small examples of this coming out. We need more of this. And then educationally, we need to be talking about media literacy with our young people. Our adults and our seniors. Who's the author of what you're seeing in the media? What is their purpose? 
for what's being put out there? What techniques are they using? Research shows that people who are more media literate are significantly more likely to be able to recognize fake news of which native advertising falls into that category. People who are more media literate with greater news expertise are also significantly less likely to like a native ad when they see it, and they're also less likely to share it. So media literacy ed education is very important. So we need to better understand what's happening in our media environment. Everybody's confused over what is what because it's not clearly indicated. So as disinformation spreads throughout our mediated platforms around the globe, this isn't a US problem, it's around the globe. An institution positioned as a bulwark against this threat, the news media, they've been compromised by its embrace of native advertising. Regulations that tinker around the edges to make native advertising less bad may be too little, too late. For as I've tried to demonstrate here today, advertisers have now colonized many newsrooms and are affecting the news agendas that digital news consumers are exposed to. Returning to the tobacco industry playbook of yesteryear, advertisers can now offer an alternate reality on all the news that's fit to print. One that is not only legitimized by news organizations, but also created by them. So remember, be a critical consumer of media content. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, thank you. It is uh, 10 after, so let's say 25 of. We'll be back here, and thank you very much, Michelle. Okay, welcome back everybody. And the door is closing. Last chance. And I'll take those questions from the box right away. Uh, okay, welcome back and uh, uh, Hillary will be our moderator and uh, Michelle is back to answer all your very difficult questions. Thank you, everybody, for these, um, this um, avalanche of amazing questions. And I wish we had time to address them all. I don't know whether we will. Uh, we'll do our best. And um, uh, they're roughly organized according to the fo focus of various questions about money, about trust, about education. And so the uh, topics may overlap a little bit or be in conflict with each other, but we'll try and help Michelle as much as possible with answering these as well. One of the first ones, which I thought was quite interesting, has to do with the definitions of terms, which has been um, an issue we've talked about in previous lectures in this series. And this question comes from Benny in Athens, Georgia. Why use the terms native advertising rather than just fake news? 
why use the term na native advertising rather than fake news? That's a good question, Benny. So um, I think I'm still mic'd up here. Okay. Um, so I think because um, native advertising is a specific form of fake news. Fake news is broader, and um, fake news is misused. Uh, it can include things that you might not like people talking about. So somebody on the news, you hear something, oh, that must be fake. That must be fake news. It can also refer to misinformation and disinformation. So fake news is very broad. Native advertising is uh, specific to paid content. Fake news isn't necessarily paid content. And I also want to clarify that native advertising isn't always inaccurate. There could be some great native content out there. Um, I've tried to highlight some of the problems with native advertising, but there are some campaigns out there that are well labeled and they have accurate information, and the reader understands this is sponsored by so-and-so, and it has valuable information. Um, I remember uh, in one study, we found a, a tweet by uh, somebody who was sharing a native ad from Lando Lakes Butter. And in the tweet, it was a woman, she said, I understand this is an ad. I still like it. Great to see they were promoting uh, women farmers who were creating the dairy for the Land O'Lakes butter. So she clearly understood that it was sponsored content, but she liked what it was saying. So just to be clear that not all native advertising is problematic. That clarifies things, I think, for me, and I hope for others as well. Thank you. Uh, this is a, sort of a follow-up question in a way. Are there any, f is there any fact-checking of native ads compared to the way it, the fact-checking of journalists' writing is carried out? So I would say yes, there probably is. So fact-checking can be an internal practice where the news organization or their content studio, when they are creating the sponsored content, they'll look to see, do we have sourced facts that support what we're arguing? So in that Chevron example I shared at the beginning of my talk about uh, global energy consumption, that was very well sourced. There were a lot of uh, links, so you could see where they were getting their statistics from. So in that sense, it was fact-checked. But it typically is not fact-checked externally. In other words, are they presenting a misleading story that serves their own interests? Perhaps is there uh, another source that's being left out because it undercuts their story, which I think is more of the problem. And I've approached some of the external fact-checking fact organizations, factcheck.org, politifact.com, um, and have posed questions to them from native ads. They typically don't want to touch it just because I don't know, I, but they declined to get involved and verify whether something uh, was accurate or not. So the, the fact checking, there's a difference between internal fact checking and external fact checking for public, to expose inaccuracies rather than internally to make sure the source you're citing is accurate and the statistic is accurate and that sort of thing. I see. and then. In terms of whether or not the content might not pass a fact-checking uh, assessment, the next question is kind of interesting. Is advertising, in a way, what we're talking about, native advertising, mm -hmm. protected free speech? 
whether or not, it, I'm adding to this question, whether or not it's accurate. And related to that is, will the FCC be allowed to regulate advertising or will the Supreme Court block this? So um, advertising is regulated by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, rather than the FCC. It depends where the content is. Is it on broadcast media or is it in print? I've been studying basically digital and print, which is the FTC's realm. They also, uh, uh, they also regulate um, traditional advertising that you see. And um, in the FTC Act, it's stated that um, the content can't be misleading. Um, it, uh, it can't be unfair to competitors, um, but it has to do with um, whether the claim has a material connection to how the product works, that sort of thing. So, Technically, the FTC could intervene if there is a native ad um, that has uh, inaccurate claims. Um, sometimes a competitor will bring um, a case to the FTC uh, to say,